breaking that down finally tells us that Davos is losing control over even Bitcoin. The Fed killed all the other stable coins that were out there because those are all synthetic dollars. Got rid of all of them and kept Tether. Why? Because Tether actually holds a whole shit ton of U.S. treasuries on the balance sheet. I believe Tether and Bitcoin are actually intimately a part of and integrated into the entire U.S. repo market at this point. And no one's talking about it. So I want to kind of revisit that. Do you think we've already seen kind of peak Davos? And where do you think we're at in this Davos life cycle? The reason why Gary Gensler, who is Davos through and through, has said no to a spot Bitcoin ETF is because Bitcoin all right, I am back with another edition of the Macro Insights Podcast. Well, we got Tom Luongo back on the show. So, Tom, thanks so much for joining joining me back again. You have an, mm -hmm. a fascinating thesis. We talked about it about six months ago now. Um, mm -hmm. But now a lot has changed. The Fed has been raising interest rates. They've kind of hit a little bit of a pause. But you have a, a fascinating thesis that explains why the Fed is raising rates. is a direct attack on Davos and Europe. So I'd love to hear an update on uh, where you think we are. Let's jump right in. Oh, sure. I think that within, I think uh, by the end of this week, we're going to know for sure that that's where we are. Um, I just published this month's Gold, Goats, and Guns newsletter. And in it, I, I warned everybody to beware the Kalins of October. Everybody's familiar with the Ides of March, right? But um, for those of us who spent too much time in high school studying Latin, we also learned the rest of the Roman calendar is the Kalins, the Knowns, or the Nones. If you're if you've taken Latin, you know that there are no um, silent letters, and then the Ides or the Ides. Actually, it would have been in in in, in Latin. Um, and my argument for this is really simple. Um, everybody's come back from the Hamptons because the summer's over, right? The guys who the the two and tw you know those those the the Jordan uh, as Tommy Carrigan likes, but the Jordan Belfort types come back after a summer at the Hamptons. You know, they put the white collar and the blue striped shirt back on, they go to work and they get back in front of their quote screens for real. And they'll wait until the end of the quarter in order to book their profits, do their book squaring, all that stuff. And then they'll start in in October and look at the state of the markets and go, all right, it's time for tax minimization strategies for the year, what worked and what didn't, uh, what happened over the summer. And they'll finally like look at this thing and go, well, what in the hell's going on here? Now, I say that, and I really thought that things wouldn't like get as bad as they've been in the last week since the FOMC meeting, that I, I might wind up being right a little early. And we're doing this, what, on the 25th, um, the first day of the last week of Q3. And what happened this morning? Well, actually, let's back up and let's talk about Friday. So on, um, actually, let's go even back even further and go back to Wednesday. Or should we go back to the week before Thursday when Lagarde raised rates and then stated while little, literally throwing up a little in her mouth because she was so uncomfortable saying, this will be the last rate hike. Well, that's nice. When a central banker makes a statement like that, that's the time when the bond vigilantes, you know, the guys who don't actually exist, are supposed to step in and start testing that situation. The minute, for example, last year when Kuroda at the BOJ said, hey, we're, we're going to widen yield curve control, the target from 0.25% to 0.5% on the long end of the, of the Japanese yield curve, he got tested immediately. When Ueda took over late, earlier in the year and said, yeah, we're thinking about tweaking that out to 1%, we actually had some bond vigilante action. They immediately took the Japanese 10 year from about 40 basis points up to 70 basis points and forced the BOJ to intervene and say, no, 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 no. The current level is 0.6, 60 basis points. We're currently at 72 basis points in the Japanese tenure. So the argument is really that the bond markets are completely mispriced relative to a Fed at 5.5%. QT is still ticking away in the background, as Daniel DiMartino Booth likes to call it, $95 billion a month. The, the, the Fed is shrinking their balance sheet aggress aggressively. Okay, all, all that's good. Nothing has changed. But look at what's happened to the euro. Now, for since the euro collapsed to 96 cents last October, so this time last year, the euro strengthened, went through a rally. But at the same time, the entirety of the European bond market hit a peak and then stopped dead cold. 
You saw the German 10-year capped by Lagarde at 2.5%. You saw the French 10-year tapped at 3%. You saw the Italian 10-year brought back down and capped at 4.25%. The Dutch uh, 10-year, I think it was 3.25%. If you go all through the European core European bond markets and look at the weekly chart of the 10-year, and you will see the exact same pattern over and over and over again, which is they try to break out above Lagarde's level one week, they get a close, and then the very next week, they bomb the market, bring yields down, throw a technical reversal signal in order to try and you know, damage the market psychology to keep the cap in place. And with each one of those interventions, it's really clear on the German 10-year. With each one of those interventions, the first one, you know, bombed the market and held it in place for about two months. And then Corota came in and changed yield curve, you know, changed the parameters and yield curve control. And then every one of them since then, and there's been about six of them, the effect has been less and less and less. And less. It's like the old argument about, you know, addictive substances, heroin and whatnot. It takes a, high, takes a higher dose in order to get more of an effect. So slowly but surely, as Powell has created certain in the bond mar- in the in the bond trading market that he's not bluffing about higher for longer and about keeping interest rates high for you know as long as he can get away with it and doing QT eventually they're like believing him and i went back and i we the last time we spoke i guess would have been in what april or march or something like that but it was in february when i said it there was at the february meeting where the bond market finally believed powell that he wasn't going to just pivot at a moment's notice. Because it was at that meeting where he he only raised by 25 basis points and the market still wasn't, was like, oh my God, he's serious. And I was like, dude, go 50 and just like rip the bandaid off and make sure everybody gets the message. Now we're at that inflection, we're at that moment where all of this yield curve control that Lagarde's been doing, Yellen's been helping her by selling more twos then tens in order to keep the price of, in order to keep the supply of 10 years, US 10 years tight, in order to keep the yield curve as inverted as possible. That's been going on all year long. And Yellen has, you know, been doing that for a variety of reasons, some of which can be explained by domestic policy concerns, fiscal concerns, rising um, interest on the debt and, you know, interest payments on the debt and all the rest of it. And some of it can be, attributed to her trying to help Lagarde keep yields in place over in Europe, which I firmly believe is what she's been doing. Every moment, whenever Lagarde gets into trouble, Yellen seems to step in and do something. And usually does something, and she's been trying to do drastic things. And the most drastic one was her visit to Beijing in July on the eve of the NATO summit. And I wrote about this and I talked about it extensively. And it just became very obvious to me when that happened that in the response, that's when the dollar got you know shellacked right on the, the day before the NATO summit started. And uh, the Chinese clearly came in and started selling dollars and selling, you know, and buying some treasuries, I believe. Um, and the TIC report finally came out this month and proved that they were doing it through Hong Kong, by the way. Um, and, um, but that lasted, I expected that, cr- that crash in the dollar to like get them through to the end of the year. And it didn't, it got them three weeks. And when that happened and it only kept three weeks, I'm like, holy Jesus, is it that bad? Have the bond vigilantes already begun to return? Is Powell himself the ultimate bond vigilante calling the bluff of Lagarde and all the other major central banks, like, oh, really? You're going to stop raising rates? You still think you've got inflation tamed? Well, we know inflation hasn't been tamed. And the reason we know inflation hasn't been tamed is because oil, thanks to the Russians and the Saudis, is at $94 a barrel, or it's down to 92 this morning, but it's going to throw. But, but, uh, uh, but at the end of this quarter, as long as Brent crude closes above around 87 bucks, we're going to throw a massive breakout signal uh, to, on the upside for oil from, on the quarterly chart, which is going to set up the oil trade and the rest of the commodity trade for 2024, meaning inflation is going to return and Powell's going to have all the cover that he needs to keep raising rates if he needs to. 
since he raised in the end of at the July meeting, which I actually didn't expect him to do. I expected him to raise in September. And, you know, he was going to raise in one of those two meetings. He chose July and not September. I'm like, oh, that gives him optionality. He did. He raises in September by 25 basis points. Lagarde goes 50. Lagarde now goes 25. Powell does nothing. But in the meantime, the Saudis and the Russians take upwards of 1.3 million barrels of production off the market between the two of them. And then after Powell puts on his resting hawk face at the meeting on Wednesday, and says, yeah, well, you know, and convince the entire Federal Reserve Board they got to go higher when the dot plot came out 50 basis points above the market expectations. We saw a sell-off in the long end of the curve. And this, and the point that I'm, I'm getting at elliptically to set the whole background is that if you look at the way the markets are trading this morning, the euro is below six. The German 10 years at 2.8. So Lagarde at some point was going to lose the ability to defend either the euro or credit spreads or she's going to lose both. She's been trying to defend one versus the other, and she kind of goes back and forth. On Friday, Yellen announced that she's going to start doing yield curve control through the Treasury, which is, again, another panic move by both of them. Because what does Yellen saying she's going to come in and step in? Why would she want to be doing bond buying? Why would she want to be you know intervening in the market? Well, it's because the market is clearly becoming illiquid at these current prices on the long end of the curve. The short end of the curve, right around the Fed funds rate, the bottom end of the Fed funds rate range. But the long end of the curve, inverted by 70 to 80 basis points. This is a problem, right? So if Yellen is worried about that, she needs to, and she can't, you know, it's she can't affect the short end of the curve. She's already issuing three-month money at 5.5%. We've been at 5.5% for more than three months, right? So those are all getting rolled over constantly, and people are moving out of the, you know, and money's moving out of the RRP facility into money markets, all the rage, and because people are not bummed, they're going, hey, I can get 5.5% on whatever money I'm sitting on. Corporates, per people, who, you know, normal folk can actually get positive money, you know, positive real yields versus the CPI. So that money's, and the banks can get this as well, so they can pull the money that they've been sitting on in the RRP facility, getting five basis points over the Fed funds rate. Now they can go in and start taking on duration. And what are we seeing? We're seeing now that the yield curve is normalized out to six months and the internal inversions, so like the six-month, one-year inversion, is down to seven basis points. The one-year, two-year is down to 28 basis points from a high of 90. The two three is down, you know, the thirty basis points. The seven ten is a or the five seven is about to go positive. So that's <coughs> fascinating, and the ten and the seven ten is improving, and the ten thirty has been positive and is getting higher. So the yield curve is, you know, it's the the short end of the curve is staying the same, and the long end of the curve is eh, starting to rise, and it's getting shallower, and it's going to normalize. What's that going to do to Lagarde at the ECB? She can't defend credit spread. She can't defend um, her yield caps. And she can't defend the euro. Why can't she defend the euro? Well, because she has to buy, because the eurozone needs to buy energy. And energy is expensive. So inflation is going to come back. And the bond vigilantes, I think, Starting this week, but it's I could really blow open a week from now and the beginning of Q4 when everybody starts setting up their strategies for 2024 and tax minimization strategies for Q4. That's when I think we could have a massive shift. I, mean, I may be wrong about this, but it's something to watch the way the market trades the first week in October. That first night could be very, very interesting because the Bank of Japan is going to have to intervene at some point begins at 149 150 is their is their limit when they always come in the nikkei you know and, the, and that'll just be a rotation out of overpriced japanese government bonds and they'll just the japanese investors will move into the nikkei which is why the nikkei is still trading above its breakout level around 325 or something like that the dow is beginning to decouple from the european bond markets it's up today or was up slightly before we started uh, recording while the German DAX was breaking down 
and throwing a reversal signal. I didn't look at the Euro stocks 50, but I did today, but yesterday it was trading nine points above that same reversal level. Again, these are quarterly reversals. These aren't like daily reversals or weekly reversals. These are quarterly reversals, which means the new trend is in place. European stocks down, the Euro down, bond yields in Europe up, US yields up, and US stocks flat to, pos to slightly positive. And Japanese yields have got to go up as well. The dollar is eating, as, and to, wait, to, to, to give Brent Johnson a shout out here, the dollar's eating everybody's lunch or drinking everybody's milkshake. But it's not as simple. I, I, you know, and I like Brent. I just had him on my, my podcast a couple, a couple of months ago. I don't think it's as simple as that, but it is you know, the core of it, which is that when you have a Fed that is actually willing not act like the central bank of the world, but act like the central bank of the United States, this is what it looks like. And this is what I said Powell needed to do two years ago. And then when he first raised the two and a half trillion dollars into the RRP facility in 2021, I had to ask the question, why would he be doing this? If he was just another globalist, he wouldn't have done that. So then you have to start to ask yourself, oh, so he started tightening before he started tightening. First, you tighten the, the, the money that actually flows, the marginal M0 of the global you know, offshore dollar markets. Mm -hmm. Then you start raising interest rates. And then you start shrinking the Fed's balance sheet. And I think that, you know, I, I, I hate to sit there and, you know, bust my hand, pat myself on the back or nothing, but that's what I said he should have done back then. And I'm like, well, if he's a sovereigntist, that's what he's going to do. And then he did it. And here we are two years later. And now you, now you can clearly see that the treasury and the fed are complete, uh, at complete odds with one another. Yellen is still working for the people who put her in power. Guard is hanging on for dear life. I'm starting to see stories in the financial press that are beginning to state this because they can't avoid it anymore. And I note that no one is talking about Powell needs to pivot. Well, they are, they're still saying it, but they're not saying it with a whole lot of conviction. So that's where we are. Yeah, I mean, and, and it, you're right, right? I mean, it, it seemed like at the beginning of this year, everybody was going to be calling for a pivot at some point this year. They pushed it back till next year, um, you know, even late next year. I think it's over there. They've pushed back the predictions to over a year from now uh, as we're recording this. And then, you know, it seems like there's they're, you know, kind of at odds with, uh, you know, the Federal Reserve obviously tightening and uh, kind of continuing to go there. But at least, you know, it's some potential from like, geopolitical conflict so you know with this it seems like it's kind of like a monetary war that we're almost kind of embarking into so yeah. how do you i guess see this playing out do you see it kind of like that in that sense where you know the u.s is uh kind of a string to pull is like the monetary policy where maybe BRICS or some of these other countries uh you know their thing to pull is more on the energy front and it seems like that's kind of like how they're attacking everybody else so how do you see all this playing out and uh you know, is, is it time to kind of buckle up for a potential of a World War III? Well, let's 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 break. There's a lot to unpack there. Let's start with let's start kind of at the at the beginning of this. When Powell first started to tighten, and I started to, someone reminded me of this the other day. So I want to like I'm going to bring this up. One of my patrons reminded me of this. Um, I guess I used because a year ago or a year and a half ago, I was saying this when Powell started to tighten. I said, if I'm right about this. You got Powell on the one side tightening money. You got Putin on the other side tightening the energy sector, commodity sector, the flow of commodities. And the ECB is in the middle because they need, because they're dependent upon dollars and they're dependent upon oil. And then all that has to happen is pull. And then you, you know, you take the rag doll that is Christine Lagarde and you just and you rip her arms off. Like Powell on one side, and then Lagarde is trying to like, she's the She's not even the flag in the middle of this tug of war. The Fed and Powell, and I don't know that Powell and Putin, I'm not even suggesting that they're coordinating behind the scenes. What I am suggesting is that every time Powell seems to make a move that is definitive, Putin supports him through the energy markets. Now, he does it for his own reasons. And certainly, 
he's no fan of the United States. But at the same time, because he shouldn't be, he's at war with the United States. So the way this plays out is that the, the tighter this noose gets around Lagarde or the more they pull in opposite directions, you know, at some point, the EU either has to break or they have to sue for peace, right? Which is part of the reason why you'll note that there's a lot of fracturing about Ukraine now. And it's coming, interestingly enough, from the, the corridors I would not have expected it. It started with France and to a lesser extent Germany, right? Macron complaining about, you know, US LNG prices and, you know, maybe we should rethink, let's get everybody to the table. Maybe we should talk about, you know, some kind of, you know, ceasefire, yada, yada, yada. And that was Macron about four or five months ago. Now, Zelensky's completely worn out his welcome with the Poles. And the Poles have been aligned with the British in trying to start World War III from the beginning. Alex Craner and I did a did a, a, a podcast right after the Nord Stream 2 bombing. And, you know, our spidey senses went off. And we both said, look, you know, Alex is very famous for saying all roads lead to London. He's not wrong about that. And I said, we just came down to the conclusion that the only people who really had a vested interest in blowing up the Nord Stream 2 pipeline regardless of who actually carried it off. Whether it was, you know, it was members of, like, it was the Brits and the Poles and the Baltics because they're the ones, they're the axis of, they're the strongest axis of anti-Russian sentiment within NATO. So, and it would then force the EU to not change policy, because what are you going to do? They, they can't stop, you know, they can't end the sanctions regime. And then you never saw really anything from anybody who actually has any power within the EU change their tune. Ursula von der Leyen is still saying, you know, Slava Ukraini, and the EU is still pledging a lot of monetary support to Ukraine, whereas the, the I saw a breakdown of it this morning of the, of the aid, and the EU is given a lot of the money. And we've given a lot of the military support. So the numbers that get thrown around about the United States giving aid to Ukraine is mostly in terms of the value of military hardware. And I'm, you know, and given Pentagon accounting, a lot of that is probably vastly overstated. Um, the entire Ukraine-Russia conflict has been, can be best described so far, other than a tremendous waste of manpower and unbelievably, you know, egregious loss of life. That could have easily been avoided was a big clearinghouse of all the old military hardware that's been sitting around everybody's stockpiles, NATO, the U S Russia, and dumped it on the battlefield to kill a few hundred thousand Slavs. Now, no one is happier about that than the British. It's been British foreign policy for 300 years to kill as many Russians as possible. You hear that out of the mouths of people like Lindsey Graham had neoconservatives like Lindsey Graham. Okay. And that's who Lindsay works for. Lindsay doesn't work for Davos. Lindsay works for the Brits. Okay. Um, so the potential here is someone has to make a, a counter move to all of this stuff. And what's that counter move? Well, the counter move is to accelerate and escalate the war in Ukraine beyond a you know, beyond the point of no return. Something that Putin has been trying to avoid since this thing began, or even been trying to avoid it for eight years. So, sorry, I dropped an ash right on my laptop and that needed to go away. Um, not particularly high quality cigar this afternoon. Um, so, that being said, expect some kind of escalation that will force Putin into the new role of being Adolf Hitler. If you thought Putler the evil Putler was a meme so far. No, I think it's still on the table that he's going to be forced into a situation. Remember, the United States just sent long range missiles with cluster ammunition, which have been outlawed and declared a, the use of, declared a war crime by the UN and everybody. And yet we're sending them 
to Ukraine for what reason? To kill Russian civilians. Because we know, or at least the Brits know, and the Brits don't give a shit because they love killing Russians, that if the Ukrainians use them to kill Russian civilians, it will force Putin into an untenable situation politically, into one of two options. Continue to get punched in the mouth, at which point he will lose popular support. Or he has to escalate and do something that takes us past the point of no return. And Martin Armstrong has been saying privately for months that that involves a small nuclear device being detonated over Kiev. Probably with plenty of warning to minimize the loss of life, but that'll be the end of it. What happens at that point? I mean, we have von der Leyen out there literally trying to say that the Russians dropped nuclear weapons on Hiroshima and Nagasaki. Like when she recounted recently the, um, the history of World War II in a speech, she conveniently left out who actually dropped the bombs while talking about how evil Russia is. That wasn't an oversight on her part. So all of these things are tied in geopolitically. The capital markets, the movements, the bond markets, what's happening on the ground. The French have now moved, are pulling out their troops out of Niger, which is a good thing, because the United States basically told the French, we're not backing you up, which is exactly what I expected to happen, because they do not believe that the real military, in the, the U.S. military, wants to fight a war with Russia. The only reason we're not in World War III with the Russians, in a fundamental way, because it could have happened in Syria over the last nine, eight years, is because, you know, our military brass does not want to fight a hot war with the Russians toe-to-toe. Okay? So, allowing the French to get wiped out of Central Africa is their way of saying, hey man, your colonial empire is ending. Again, supporting my argument that Powell is working the end of the colonial empire of Europe, old colonial empire of Europe, on the financial end, and you know, influential members of the American military are working it on the military end and the political end. And then we have the problem in the middle, of course, is that we have a bunch of geriatrics that are owned, bought, and paid for, and dirty as all get out in Ukraine, not wanting to end the um, the the project. And yet, Zelensky went to Washington, D.C. and left pretty much empty-handed. He had to go to Canada and get a whole bunch of money out of the Canadians, and the Canadians don't have any money either. So, I don't know, Brandon. It, it sounds to me like slowly but surely, this battleship is turning around within the Suez Canal and, you know, it's going to be a 50-point turn, but, you know, we're on point five or point seven. You know, we're, we're you know, we're at the nine-point mark of a 51-point turn. And it's slowly getting there. And then, the you know, and then we have the wild card of next year's elections and, and all of that that plays into this as well. Yeah, I mean, it is really interesting, right? I mean, like you said, the Ukraine tried to come to the U.S. It seems like they didn't really get much or, or what they wanted. And so they went up to Canada, who, you know, kind of welcomed them with open arms, uh, so to speak. And so, yep. I mean, what, what do you take of that dynamic of, you know, I guess the U.S. kind of almost trying to st- take a step back as we've been sending so much money and everything like that. At every turn, it seems like to the Ukraine, we kind of, you know, took a step back and then now Canada is dishing it out. Like, you know, is well, that, all right, go ahead. Well, no, I was going to say, it's not hard to figure that out because Christy Friedland, the assistant prime minister is a Ukrainian hardcore. She's, you know, she's just the Canadian version of Victoria Newland. She was placed there on purpose. Okay. She, that's why she was put in power. Look, Trudeau is the figurehead. Freeland runs the, the, the show in Ottawa. So okay. it's the same way that Olaf Scholz doesn't run Germany. Annalena Baerbach 
and Robert Habe of the Green Party, they run Germany, at least until they're, you know, until that coalition falls apart. But Scholz tried to, you know, unwind that position. And then he got thrown down the stairs when he had showed up a couple of weeks ago with an, eye, with an eye patch. Like every time these guys try to get out from underneath their, you know, their obligations to the greater power, you ever notice how they all wind up with a big cut above their eye? That's because all they, it's because it's like we paid a large Mexican $50 to throw you down the stairs. Harry Reid, Mitch McConnell, John Roberts, Olaf Scholz, they all, it always happens. John McCain, like, this stuff's not hard. It's just mafiosi tactics. It would be a real freaking shame if, you know, you, your daughter, like, you know, decided to, you know, walk off of the edge of a 50 story building. That's not, I didn't, I didn't say anything. You know, I didn't do anything, but it would be a real tragedy if you know what I mean. Like, come on. Like, I'm just Italian enough to, you know, understand how that works. I'm just Sicilian enough to know how that works. I'm mostly Italian, a little bit of Sicilian. So, I mean, and I'm from New York. Like, I get it. Like, it is what it is. So it's the way it works. It, it puts, you know, it just reminds everybody that, that Murray Rothbard was right when he called the government just, you know, it's just, it's just a mob and they wear uniforms as opposed to silk suits. It's, it's not hard. It's, that's all it is. So. Yeah. And I mean, that, that's fair to say <laughs> as everything you've lined out right there. But um, you did write an interesting article about a year or so ago that said we've seen peak Davos. We've kind of gone through, you know, like where Davos lies and all this. So I want to kind of revisit that. Do you think we've already seen kind of peak Davos? And, uh, and sure. if so, um, you know, where are we, I guess, in the Davos kind of uh, life cycle? Do you th or where do you think we're at in this Davos life cycle? Oh, I think we're definitely peak past peak Davos. The problem is, is that just because we're past the peak doesn't mean they're not still powerful because power peak. Uh, we're here. We're here. So I got to go all the way down to here. Now that fall is going to be precipitous, but during that, you know, you know, because it, you know, if it went up as a bell curve, it's going to go down like a bell curve, right? Um, and I don't think it's a particularly shallow slope bell curve. I think it's pretty, so especially, or at least it's asymmetric. It took a long time to build it, and then it's going to fall off. You know, I think it's going to fall off quickly. Um, and the key is to understanding that they don't have control, the monetary control of the United States, and therefore they're going to lose political control of the, over the United States unless something happens to the to the way the Federal Reserve is charted. So all the libertarians in the audience stops chanting in the Fed, at least until 2030. We can go back to chant because the Fed is the best asset you have to stopping the worst situation, which is that we wind up with something worse than the Fed. The Fed is terrible. And it isn't any good at what they do, but they have an unbelievable power that no one else has, which is they can control the value of dollars. And dollars are the means, and the levered up dollar, global dollar system is the means by which all of these terrible, excuse me, plutocrats that I like to call Davos are trying to enslave us with. Central bank digital currencies, 24 hour, 24 hour surveillance, or to make it simple, minority report with but with more germans right so like we don't want that and if it means that we have to you know end our we have to like put on hold our criticism of central banking as an institution we can do that because we should be thinking strategically and not doctrinaire philosophically we should always be thinking strategically. How do we get what we want? How do, what steps do we have to go through to get what we want? And that might mean, you know, getting your hands dirty, you know, shaking hands with the devil for a little while. Sorry, it's just the way it is. It doesn't mean you have to, you know, like central banking. You can hold those two positions at the same time. Philosophically, I'm against central banking and I want sound money and all the rest of it. On the other side of it, well, the central bank, our central bank may be our best ally in this it's the same it's the same way of, of looking at the u.s civil war from the perspective of global politics of the time like the u.s civil war if you're if you're a libertarian or if you're you know american you know if you believe in states rights and you believe in the the, the founding principles of the constitution and everything else the south was right philosophically the north was acting tyrannically absolutely and every you know there's no argument the tariff of abomination was wrong all of that stuff, it, it was against the initial compact between the states and the union. 
But like today, because today is a clear example of the same thing, that was being the division between North and South was being stoked by the old colonial European powers in a divide and conquer strategy. Divide the United States and then conquer it later. So while, yes, Lincoln was a tyrant, sure, out of context, he was. No argument. And yet, the North winning the Civil War, or what we like to call down here the recent unpleasantness, was right in a historical context to get us to where we need to go, which is to truly be able to extricate ourselves from overseas political and monetary influences. When you take the 250-year timeline of the United States and realize that the Declaration of Independence is a nice document, but it was just a declaration. It didn't actually achieve independence. Neither did the war for independence when Cornwallis surrendered at Yorktown. We then wound up fighting the, the War of 1812, what, 23 years later. And then we wound up fighting the Civil War internally 48 years later. And then we wound up a adopting Britain's foreign policy 50 years after that under Woodrow Wilson and adopting an income tax and the Federal Reserve and LIBOR and the direct election of senators turning the Senate into the House of Lords as opposed to something that would what it was originally supposed to do, which was advocate for the states versus the people. Like when you look at it, you have to realize that throughout that entire process, the United States actually hasn't been free of overseas influence. What we have been has been, in effect, and I don't want to say the plaything, but the, you know, depending on how you want to look at it, the willing partner of colonial empires who don't have our best interests at heart, but are supposedly our allies. So has the American Revolution actually, you know, occurred from that perspective? I'm not saying it's the only perspective, but it is a certainly an interesting one to look at. And the answer is clearly no, because the British controlled our money through LIBOR and the eventual destruction of the gold standard and, you know, and all of it. So here we are today. And I've been saying this for a while now, and I said it again the other day. That's why SOFR, the Secured Overnight Financing Rate, which now has replaced LIBOR, is the real Declaration of Independence of the United States. Because now we have not only political independence, nominally, but we have financial independence at a structural level. And you, the system has been built, adopted, and now it needs to be torn down slowly and carefully. And that's what Powell's doing. And I firmly believe that's what Powell's doing now. I'm more convinced of this now than I ever have been. And, you know, he could betray me in six months. I don't know. But as of right now, he has done yeoman's work to create this. So he's being attacked from all, on all sides. He's having, he's had um, Obama dub, Dabogian style doves added to the FOMC person after person. Go listen to Daniel DiMarpino Booth. She'll go over all of these people in grave detail because she knows them better than I do. And they're just trying to wait him out until his term ends so that they can, you know, get control of the Fed again. And that's why Yellen's doing yield curve control. That's why uh, Lagarde is doing yield curve control. And that's why the Russians and the Saudis are like, you know what? No, send oil to $150 a barrel. Because yield curve control can't work for energy dependent countries. $150 a barrel. Can't happen. So, and, you know, when you start to look at the, you know, it's again, it's been a, I, I just, I just, I define these things in terms of races. You know, can we get, can Powell hang on long enough for the next generation of American um, politicians to come in, take power from, the olds that are clogging up the system, the Pelosi's and the McConnell's and the Patrick Leahy's and there, and, and some of them are retiring, right? I think Patrick Leahy's gone, but you know, some of them are retiring, the Steny Hoyers and all those guys, right? The Lindsey Graham's John McCain is thankfully gone, you know, 
because we can, you know, we can uh, say a, a moment of silence for his brain tumor that I regret for, regret that it only had one life to give for its country because it couldn't have taken like, you know, Graham and a few other people with it. But sadly, they're not contagious um, in that respect. But, you know, like, dude, I don't I, I don't mince words. I, I think all these people need need to go and I won't mourn them a moment when they're gone. And I, you know, it's almost like these people are going to stay in power long enough to be to actually literally stroke out on the floor of Congress. And then we have to have a, like, you know, then we have to have like the Nancy Pelosi national holiday of when we adopt communism or something because she gave her entire life for the cause. Like, I'm, no, absolutely not. No one should mourn her. Like her family's not going to mourn her for Christ's sake. Why the hell should we? But I could, you know, I could do this for an hour, Brandon. You don't even have to be here. I can just like talk. It's not a problem. I'll shut up now and you can take the mic back. <laughs> no, I mean, I love it. I mean, that, that's why that's why I wanted to have you back on, you know, to talk about a, a lot of these different topics and, you know, see how kind of the, the thesis de is developing. But another interesting aspect, right? I mean, we're having a lot of like, you know, obviously we, we brought up the election a little bit earlier. We've ha we're having mm -hmm. a lot of uh, conversations surrounding the dollar, um, mm -hmm. you know, especially from some of the, the new candidates, right? I mean, we've even had you know, RFK Jr. propose of uh, making the dollar backed by hard assets, like a mm -hmm. combination of real estate, gold, Bitcoin, maybe even, and, and a bunch of different other hard assets. Um, so, you know, I guess, do you take that as almost another attack on, on the Fed where, you know, the president is almost trying to, I guess, take away the, the monetary policy power from the Fed? Or, uh, you know, what do you kind of make of all of this, like, I guess, proposal and, and talk around uh, fiat currencies? Because it seems like it's it's a lot more in the news now, uh, especially with this election coming up than it was four years ago. No, actually, I think it's part of the process. I, I think Powell, Martin Armstrong's talked about this a lot. And again, I, you know, as a as a doctrinaire Austrian who hates central banking, Martin, I, I give Martin a lot of credit for. I don't always give Martin credit for Socrates and all that, but I do give Martin a lot of credit for just understanding, you know, how global capital flows and, and, and all that. And so and so here's one. I, I, I think he's right in saying, look, the Federal Reserve's original intention and design wasn't fundamentally bad. I disagree with him about that, but it's certainly better than the way it operates now, which is originally we should have 12 regional interest rates. We should have 12 regional banks that, that, that regulate the banks in each of the sectors. We should have co internal competition for capital within all of the areas of the country. That's the way it should be. He's right about that. And that the Fed should stick to its mandate of just supplying elastic money to the banking sector during moments of crisis in order to um, keep the system liquid, keep the banking system liquid so that people can get, still go to work, get access to their money, you know, buy gasoline, buy food and all the rest of it while the banking sector works out its excesses. Like if the central bank didn't, didn't, did nothing but that, that would be great. The Austro-Libertarian critique is that it will never hold that line, which is why, and it's the Fed was always destined to become the thing that it's become. Great. I, I also get that. But now that we've reached that peak of kind of Fed power and it's reached, it's, a, it's the peak of its ability to impose Keynesian bass backwards economic arguments. And it's not even Keynesian anymore, but kind of Keynesian. Because even Keynes would be like, what in the hell are you guys doing? Now, like I said, I talk about Davos, have we reached peak Fed? Or at least we've reached peak modern Fed, where the, it can take over the entire and become the monetary system. I think we've reached that point, especially with a guy like Powell, who's saying, no, no, no. We can go back to we can roll the Fed back in many ways or begin to roll the Fed back in many ways to its something closer to its original um, intended, you know, uh, design. SOFR, I think, gives us in a very long-term sense the opportunity for that to take place and have the Fed funds rate effectively go away and be replaced by SOFR, the SOFR futures curve, and how it trades, you know, regionally. I think it, I think it's possible that, you know, the far, so what we should be pushing for as, you know, good Austro-libertarians 
Because remember, there's the libertarian Hippocratic Oath, do as little harm as possible to the people who are actually getting screwed by this system. Oh, by the way, it's very important, all you libertarians who are chuckling and collapsitarian out there, just tear it all down, burn it to the ground, and hey, okay, so you know, put on your, your best Heath Ledger Joker face and, and, and play the game. No, 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 that's wrong. Bitcoin doesn't solve this, FYI. It may eventually, but it doesn't solve it now. We should be pushing towards that. And I think people like RFK bringing back up what his uncle wanted to do, which was to make sure that we didn't go off of a, a hard money standard, which is my argument is, I, I believe that's the main reason why he was, excuse me, why he was killed. I think that that's a very powerful argument from him because it's literally dovetailing into how we as a country get out of the debt the looming debt crisis that's out there. How do we maintain real positive interest rates, right? And non-zero interest rates with all these unfunded liabilities, you know, and pay everything off and still keep interest rates at a, at a, at a, at a level high enough to properly or come close to properly pricing risk, right? Without going broke, without defaulting on the debt, because that's our superpower. Well. Um, you got to do that by throwing gold out on the yield curve, right? And um, so you remonetize gold effectively. Remember, RFK actually took my talking point and talked about it. I don't know where he heard it from or who he was talking to. And it's not my idea. It came from Judy Shelton originally. I just did my best to try and popularize it and spread it out into the zeitgeist as much as possible because it's a brilliant idea. You take, you issued long-term treasuries with a 5 or 10% gold redemption clause with a low dollar coupon. And that minimizes the amount that we have to actually pay out in dollars to service the debt. And then, you know, you restabilize the, the system that way. You allow the price of gold to rise. And, you know, you now start recapitalizing the entire, um, you re start recapitalizing the, the, the central bank while you cut spending. You cut waste, you cut fraud, you cut all these stupid regulations that are literally designed to do nothing but destroy the American economy, all of which were put in place by Davos. So part of what peak Davos really is, is going away, getting rid of that whole regulatory legislation state, which is that has now been erected. So that's why the Supreme Court taking up the challenge to the Chevron deference, which established by the Supreme Court back in the 70s, that um, the, the precedent that the administrative agencies operating under best practices would then set the policy for Congress to rubber stamp. It, Congress deferred its legislative authority to the EPA, the Department of Energy, you know, health and human services, and all of that stuff, they make policy. And Congress just rubber stamps it because of the Chevron deference. Get rid of the Chevron deference, declare it unconstitutional. Now, all of a sudden, Congress gets all of its legislative power back. Remember, the, the history of my lifetime, I'm 55 years old, from a legislative perspective, has been one Congress after another after another abdicating their essential role as the legislative branch of government and transferring that legislative authority to the executive branch, creating a king. Which is exactly, and then all they had to do after that, because, you know, commies hate elections, is to rig the election so that no matter who wins, we lose. Look at the European Union. Look at the way the European Union is designed and then tell me there's one shred of actual, honest to God, popular input into EU dictates. Bupkis, zero. It's designed to make sure that populism can't happen because to these people, populism is a four-letter word. Yeah, I mean, it, you're, you're definitely like lining, lining it all out and it makes a ton of sense, um, you know, potentially to get back to a hard money standard. Uh, but sure. it seems like, you know, it would be pretty difficult to implement uh, and something that 
probably couldn't be turned into in, into one, you know, kind of, a, I guess, election cycle, so to speak. Um, so like if RFK were to get in, you know, I guess, and his proposal were to, you know, kind of go, go along this route, it, it's interesting because he's a part of the Democratic Party who's, you know, been pretty outspoken about Bitcoin, um, you know, a lot of people against that. And it seems like they kind of, uh, I guess, like to have that kind of governmental control over that monetary policy a little bit more than uh, maybe the Republican Party or the Libertarian, the other sides of things. Um, so I guess what would you make of, of all that if RFK were to potentially get elected? You know, it, is it even possible to do what he's saying? Um, or It know, is, but he's not going to get elected as a Democrat. And he's not going to get elected. They're going to freeze him out. And they're going to force him to run independent. This is going to be a replay. I've been thinking about this since 2020. Or even just early 2022. This is going to lay out like the 1980 election. John Anderson. Or it's going to wind up like the 92 election. Depending on how they, they handle this. I keep saying that the... I thought originally it would be somebody like Tulsi Gabbard or even Ron DeSantis would run as a as a John and John Anderson style insurgent on the left because the Democrats right now, as of right now, the only reason that Joe Biden is still president and hasn't been impeached and hasn't been replaced because he's clearly sundowning is because they they haven't decided on the line of succession yet. Hillary wants back in. The Brits want a neocon on both sides so that they win. Davos wants what they want, blah, 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 blah. There are at least three wings of the Democratic Party right now. And they're losing the, the core of the party that they lost in 2016, which allowed Trump to come to power, right? They're losing Hispanics and Blacks. They're losing the soccer moms with all this, you know, with, with all the... You know, with all the LGBTQ, IBBQ sauce stuff, right? They're losing that. They can't win without the soccer moms, right? So they'll allow Trump to run if they've got it buttoned up on the other side because the soccer moms will still just reflexively vote against Trump. But at the same time, they'll freeze RFK out regardless. They've already assent, effectively said so. And with the superdelegate system within DNC, there's no way that RNC, you know, RFK could win all the states and still lose. Like It's just ridiculous. So I think it's he's going to wind up being the John Anderson figure that steals votes the Democratic candidate on the left, which is why the neocons are putting up all of their, you know, it's all just neocons across the board. On And then we put Trump in jail, they're thinking. And then we either have, Nimrata, I mean, Nikki Haley, you know, H1B Obama, Vivek, or God, God forbid, Chris Christie, Mike Pence, whatever. All those people are just, they're all rotten and they're all terrible. But that's what they're, that's their plan. So that you split the left, you have RFK run like that, and then you wind up and then you neutralize Trump, but they may not be able to neutralize Trump, which is, you know, why is the WAPO, the Washington Post, publishing a poll that says Trump is beating Biden nationally by 10 points. If that wasn't a push poll, I mean, the Washington Post works for the CIA and the CIA works for MI6 and MI6 works for old British neoconservatives. So again, I've been saying for years that there's the neocons, the Anglo sphere neocons and the old colonial Europeans are not the same people. They have acted in concert when they were winning. They are no longer winning. Now they are now they are clearly split. So now the question is, you know, that's what they're hoping for. They can force RFK into the, the maneuver to run independently. He runs as independent from the left, ensuring that the Democratic candidate, whoever it is, doesn't win. And then we get H1B Obama um, or, you know, the Waffle House waitress, Nikki Haley which is who they're clearly behind. We'll see. If so, then they win. And then we have World War III regardless because, you know, we just put it off for another year. If Trump is able to survive all this and not wind up in jail because, you know, 
legally he's an idiot and he can't keep his mouth shut. I don't know. But there's clearly nothing coming from the right. The bigger problem for the Democrats is my friend Dexter White, my friend and partner Dexter White, and I talked about the other day when I was telling, I was laying this exact thing out in the conversation we were having. And he said, their bigger problem is that they could turn RFK into Perot. And then they don't have an answer. Because what if their plan is to put up Kamala Harris in order for Harris to lose to Haley? And then Harris turns out to be just shrewd enough to have just enough freaking game to take the best offer. Why do you think they're trying to sideline her? Then it becomes an interesting story because I think Kamala Harris, while she may not be the sharpest tool in the drawer, in the knife in the drawer, she is shrewd when it comes to power. And she's on Team Harris. She ain't on Team Obama. She ain't on Team Hillary. She ain't on Team Davos. She ain't on Team Neocon. She's on Team Kamala. So, again, I don't have a prediction here. I'm just laying out what I see are the elements. You figure out what's going to happen. but. The landscape as it stands right now is that they may wind up having to go with Biden because they don't have a choice because we're less than three months away from the primary season and no one's declared there's no, you know, what are they doing? They can't raise money. Trump is raising money left and right. And if they put him in jail, he'll win the auction from jail. If RFK turns into Perot, and then he pardons himself, walks out, you know, has a Diet Coke and smirks at the camera, and then it's just hilarious. All bets are off, dude. And then the other side of this, what I haven't brought in, is that everything that I've outlined vis-a-vis Powell, and to a lesser extent what I've outlined vis-a-vis the DOD, the, the U.S. military, speaks to a sovereigntist set within the United States that is trying to to turn this thing around. And they are going to control who wins the election. And is that group, Wall Street, working within the Democratic Party to blow it apart? Is that Jamie Dimon? I don't know. But looking at the way the game board is laying out, looks like it could be. I don't think Diamond's running for president or VP or anything else, but clearly these guys are going to decide who is, you know, they always decide who's going to run. And the quote unquote military industrial complex, now that they've emptied all the, um, you know, they've emptied all the, the coffers and they want, they need to be refilled. Like that's plenty of make work to reindustrialize the United States and, and you know, with, Hardware that, you know, actually works as opposed to the F-35. I haven't even brought in the potential for the Chinese to be screwing with things and the Russians to be screwing with things. Yeah, that's a, that's a given. I'm just talking about the, the natural imperatives within all of these different factions. And the knives are out. So beware of the calends of October. Because it starts in the bond market. Man, that, that's a way to uh, circle it all back. I really appreciate how you did that and, and and brought that back to there. But you mentioned Jamie Diamond. Obviously, you know, a lot of the, uh, <clears throat> you know, all the people that, uh, you know, are kind of, uh, I guess, managing the money, the large banks and everything like that. Obviously, the large companies as well are kind of, you know, I guess, pulling the strings behind the scenes, maybe even more than the, than the politicians. Um, you know, BlackRock is definitely one of those, right? I mean, BlackRock has kind of. BlackRock's you know, been chasing, Brandon. Has been Notice chasing. how black. Notice how Black BlackRock clearly grabbed for the the tit too early on problem. Clearly, what Larry Fink. Oh, they clearly went after like the uh, um, the real estate markets, and they really thought that they had you know access. Remember, BlackRock was given access to the Fed discount window during during COVID through the CARES Act, and they used it to buy a whole bunch of com- uh, commercial and residential real estate at zero percent. Larry Fink has genuflected these. He's he's pulled back on ESG. He's pulled back on, like, at the end of the day, he's made no friends on Wall Street. When I brought this up to Daniel Booth when I had her on the podcast over the summer, she 
I, I said, I want to talk about BlackRock. And the first thing that came, into her, came out of her mouth was, and yeah, Think has made no friends on Wall Street. And they'll tear them apart. And they're tearing them apart. They're going to, they're, te- you know, BlackRock was clearly in bed with Klaus Schwab, was clearly in bed with the globalists to do X, Y, and Z. I'm not saying that JP Morgan isn't in some way or they're not going to benefit from this. Like everybody's dirty here. Nobody's a white hat, right? Like, yeah, BlackRock and JP Morgan have gotten the, the contracts to rebuild Ukraine. Do you think they want to get on with that business? Kind of do. You know? So, you know, there's payola that's going to happen here. There are envelopes and manila folders that are going to hit desks all around, that are hitting desks all around the country. There's going to be deals made. And none of the, and, you know, and those deals are deals that we're, that we're going to look at them from the outside, from our perspective, and think, you know, that's pretty shady. Someone's going to write it, you know, going to clearly, you know, do the right thing and write an article exposing all of this stuff. It doesn't mean that it didn't serve a greater strategic purpose. And in order to get, you know, things finished, get th- get more important things across the finish line, you know, you got to give to get. It's politics. It's business. It's the way it is. And if you wind up with a whole bunch of deals that no one's completely happy with, that's probably the best deal you were going to get, right? Yeah, that's a fair point. So, I mean, but but one more one more question about BlackRock sure. before I let you go. Uh, you said that they're kind of been been late in chasing tail. Well, you know, obviously they had the, the big news. They're they're filing filing for the Bitcoin spot ETF. So I'd be mm-hmm. remiss to ask if I if I didn't get your opinion on that and how things are going with that. And and you know, at the end of the day, like. You know, I guess, what do you think that, that their, uh, you know, purpose of filing for this is? Uh, are there any potential, I guess, attacks that we should be cautious about? Or do you think, um, you know, it's another kind of case of BlackRock just kind of, I guess, trying to catch up? Maybe. I, so Vince Lanchi and I just pu- published a podcast, episode 154 of the Gold, Goats, and Guns podcast. I really do recommend everybody listen to it. It's mostly Vince's ideas. I help prompt him. We go through the whole thing. We sandbag the audience because we both know what we're talking about. But it's important because it's a very complicated thing about how um, how we're seeing a we're seeing capital controls go up around all the high quality hard assets, gold, silver, and you can include Bitcoin in that. The reason why Gary Gensler, who is who is Davos through and through, has said no to a spot Bitcoin ETF is because. Bitcoin um, is potentially a reserve asset, just like gold is. And because of that, like GLD and SLV, if BlackRock and possibly even Grayscale, GBTC being turned into um, an on-chain, on-chain settled physical Bitcoin ETF, these are bitcoins that are not going to ever leave the United States. The COMEX is a futures market. You can stand for delivery, and if you're a foreign actor, you can stand for delivery on the COMEX, and you can get gold, and you can take it out of the country. The COMEX is being drained, and all the COMEX gold is being drained into GLD. Same thing is happening with silver and, and SLV. Why? Because shareholders of GLD and SLV cannot get gold out of either of those ETFs unless they are trusted partners of the American government, as opposed to the COMEX. So this is what Vincent and I were talking about on this podcast. I really do recommend everybody listen to it. And I recommend not listening to it at one and a half speed because there's a lot of freaking high concept stuff going on there. Otherwise, you're going to just need to listen to it four times. You're not going to save yourself any time anyway. Some things and some ideas need to be savored in this age of media saturation where everybody's trying to get as much information into their head as cram it as much as information into their head within their a lot of times possible. Sometimes it's better to, to consume less and think more. A BlackRock on-chain settled ETF for Bitcoin could be their get. for giving up ESG, for giving up on, 
you know, this whole idea of the great taking that's going on, that this book that's going around, the great taking, um, that they had planned. Which I've always looked at and went, yeah, it sounds great that they legally are going to put all this stuff in place in order to take all of our free land and then force us in the pods and eat bugs and all the rest of it. Yeah, sounds great. Uh, there's only this, this uh, the 800 million little problems. They're called the guns owned by Americans. And when that may, and, and you go to evict somebody from their freaking home and they got to bring a sheriff's officer. Really? You think, yeah, I don't know about you, but all, every time I think about something like that, all I can think of is Old Brother, Where Art Thou? Do you remember the Coen Brother movie, Old Brother, Where Art Thou? And they show up at Pete's cousin's place and there's, they're walking down the road. They're met by a little kid, a little nine-year-old kid carrying a shotgun that's bigger than he is, going, you fellas from the bank! Because my daddy told me to shoot and the ambassador came from the bank. That was the Great Depression. That was the 1930s. I got news for you. There are way too many people here in the state, great state of Florida who will tell the banks to go scratch. Go back to 2008, when people were two years in arrears on their mortgages. They already sent the keys back with their payment that they weren't, take my house. And it took two years to get rid of them. They still lived in the houses for two years after they stopped making payments on it. Like, it's not possible. Like, it's all this, this freaking power fantasy and a lark. Stroke of the pen, law of the land, kind of cool, Paul Begala shit. That's not reality because this stuff has to be implemented. I, I, the last time I talked about this, I, I, I mentioned, I, I think I was on Mel K show or whatever. I talked about my dad, right? My dad was NYPD. And dad didn't talk about the job very much. And he was NYPD from the late 50s through the early 80s. Okay. So all the race riots in the 1970s and, you know, the, the stuff in the 1960s and all of it. He worked all of that stuff. And he worked in Bedford-Stuyvesant Bedford in Brooklyn and then the South Bronx. My dad worked in nothing but shitholes. And one of the few, when you know, he wouldn't talk about the job much, but he did talk about the job here and there. I think it may have been when he and I were, I actually interviewed him for a high school project and I asked him about this. And he started telling me, like during a riot, the cops don't arrest the rioters. Because for every rioter you arrest, you got to take a cop off the street and book him and take him to, and then before you can bring him back, put him back out on the street. So the cops are there to protect the people who aren't rioting, whose property is under attack and siege to try and, help as many people who aren't breaking the law, who aren't rioting as possible. And yeah, you might go in there, assholes and elbows and break some heads and whatnot, but you're not going to arrest anybody because there's no point. There's not enough enforcement for this kind of stuff. So the whole idea of all of this stuff to me is just this, a massive LARP. Just a massive LARP. So yeah, they're going to try it. But it's not going to work. And I think finally somebody put that into Larry Fink's head and went, dude, if you really think that that's what's going to happen because your power is so damned assailable, unassailable, let me introduce you to my cousin Vinny. And Vinny's a leg breaker for the mob. Okay. So I just don't buy it, Brandon. Like, I, you know, so much of this stuff, I'm like, it's just not going to work. Everybody knows it's not going to work. And if we push back against them one little bit, the whole thing collapses. So, in my mind, that's the way we have to approach this stuff. Don't let them gaslight us into thinking that they're going to be able to take all our stuff and, you know, take our homes and all the rest of it. No. What's happening is... A BlackRock Bitcoin ETF or and or Grayscale are going to be treated just like GLV, D and SLV. They're going to be cash settled markets for these assets that don't need futures curves other than silver. Silver needs a futures curve, but gold and Bitcoin don't. There's no need for a Bitcoin futures market. There's no need for a gold futures market. We have them. They're called interest rates. It's called the yield curve, as Vince so eloquently put it in the podcast we did together. We don't need them. What we need is to keep them from flowing 
out of the country and everybody's doing it. Russia's doing it. China's doing it. Iran is doing it. The, uh, the Middle East is doing it through UAE. And now we're doing it. We're going to do it differently, but we're doing it. And that's all that matters here. Like, so to me, breaking that down finally tells us that Davos is losing control over even Bitcoin. And the rest of crypto, as far as I'm concerned, at this moment in time can go hang. Because it's crypto, it's not Bitcoin. Bitcoin is a potential reserve asset. Bitcoin is also, thanks to Tether, a real big liquidity sink for U.S. treasuries. And you keep Bitcoin liquefied by keeping one stable coin on the market. And so I firmly believe, and this is just me doing some, you know, inductive or deductive reasoning here, the Fed killed all the other stable coins that were out there because those are all synthetic dollars. Got rid of all of them and kept Tether. Why? Because Tether actually holds a whole shit ton of U.S. treasuries on the balance sheet. So I don't believe any of the Tether fight at this point. I may have believed it three or four years ago. I don't believe it anymore. I believe Tether is actually part of the Tether and Bitcoin are actually intimately a part of and integrated into the entire U.S. repo market at this point. And no one's talking about it except me. And I may be wrong, but the incentives line up. Yeah, I mean, I could definitely see that. And I could definitely see where the incentives kind of lie as well. But, uh, you know, I, you've been very generous with your time. I feel like I could talk to you and we could have like a five hour podcast or something here. But I, I want to cut it short a little bit just sure. just so we can have room for another conversation, maybe six months or a year down the line. And we can check back in on your thesis and, and how things are going, uh, especially maybe maybe coming up on election time. We'll, we'll have you back on. But um you know tom you've been very generous of course so uh tell everybody where they can find all your stuff and obviously you've mentioned you know a podcast episode i'll link that in the show notes um so yeah tell us uh tell us where they can find you and uh what all you got going on so you can find my my public work over at my blog at tomluongo.me that's where you can find dot me that's where you can find you know i I cross post all the podcasts there um you can find a link to the patreon which is where a lot of the the content that i actually produce on a regular basis now is kind of behind the paywall because my, my patrons take up, you know, they get they get paid first because, well, they're paying me. Um, that's where you get the biweekly market reports, which are both a technical analysis and um, and regular rant about the issues of the day and how that all is playing out in the, in the, in the capital markets. Um, I'm going to do those every Wednesday and every Sunday. I usually do at least one private blog post a week trying to go over some of the other stuff that's going on. That shows up as public blog posts in some form or another later on. Um, you can follow me on Twitter at TFL1728, where the worst version of me will show up guaranteed every day because, by God, it's too much fun. And then, of course, I just pimped the Patreon um, at Patreon slash Gold Goats and Guns, where you can sign up for the market reports, a private discussion server, and, um, and the monthly newsletter, which is where we put a portfolio together to try and make sense of all this. So that's what we do. And it's mostly for retail investors. I mean, I, I talk high concept a lot, but we do try to break it down uh, into brass tacks when I'm asked to remind myself, hey, dude, you go over the primitives because this, there's a lot going on here. And I'm doing a better job of that as I go as I go along. So there we go. Yeah. And it's all great stuff. So I definitely recommend checking it out and check them out on Twitter too, because Tom's always posting some heat on there. So Tom, man, thanks so much. Appreciate it, Brandon. Thank you. Have a great afternoon. Thanks so much for tuning in, everybody, on the latest episode of the Macro Insights Podcast with Tom Luongo, the man. And if you want to catch some more content, go ahead and click this button right here, and you can watch my latest episode with Marty Bent. If you enjoyed this, please hit that like button, hit that subscribe button, help your boy out. All right, I'll see you at the next one.